everyone, and welcome to Before College TV Live. Today, we are with Princeton University students. Hey, panel, how are you doing? A big wave and a hello. Hello. It's very exciting to have you here. I'm so grateful. We are going to get to know you and explore you, your lives at Princeton, why you decided to go to Princeton, and uh, everything else that you want to share to help high school students and parents to be able to get a sense of what's going on on campus. So I always like to start these things off, especially during coronavirus season, uh, with a question. And I think I'll start with, I'm gonna start with Kate. Now, Kate, uh, it is April 8th, 2020. I wanna date this for the time capsule. We are in the midst of a pandemic. You can see Kate's, Kate has her pandemic face on. Uh, it's April 8th. It is approximately 4.42 Eastern time. If the world hadn't turned upside down, and Paige and Ben, I'm gonna be asking this question as well. I want you to tell me exactly, where would you be right now on a Wednesday, it's Wednesday, Wednesday, a Wednesday at 4.42 p.m. at Princeton? Where would you be? What would you be doing? Um. My, I was supposed to open a show this weekend, so that show, I would probably be running to my, our final dress rehearsal for it, that would probably be starting at 5.30, and I get out of class at 4.20, so I'd probably be maybe running to the dining hall, grabbing some dinner. What dining hall? Um, probably Whitman, because I'm coming from the Lewis Center, which is at the bottom of campus, and going across, so probably Whitman College Dining Hall. What would you eat at Whitman? Oh, I don't know. What's your favorite? And you all can jump in if you have a favorite at Whitman. Don't feel like this is only Kate. You know, if you have thoughts, I'm going to get you about your timing. But at Whitman, <laughs> is Whitman a good dining hall? Yeah, it's really good. I love Whitman. Um, I would say, oh, I wish they had their shepherd's pie because that's my favorite, but usually that's only lunch. Can you explain what shepherd's pie is to those yeah, who aren't they, as familiar? They do like the bowl with like the, or maybe it's not shepherd's pie, it's like the chicken pot pie with mm. the, like the bowl with the crusty, like cr almost croissant flaky dough on top. And then it's like the warm chicken and the green peas and everything with the broth underneath. Mm, I could Very almost warming. taste it. You should work in food services. That was delicious. <laughs> uh, that was wonderful. So, okay. At 442, I, I can spend the whole time talking about how devastated I am for you with this show. Um, we'll get back to that, but I'm so, I know there's so many things going on, but what you all do, and we're gonna dig in, like these people are so interesting and what you do is so fascinating and what you're not able to do is so sad because you do so many cool things. But let's move on, I'll go to Paige. So Paige, tell me, it's 4.44, it's Wednesday, you're at Princeton, the world is an upside down, what are you doing? Yeah, um, I'm probably going to a meeting for some kind of club that I'm involved in. Um, Can you guess what club it would be? Tell us, like, or yeah. just make it up. Um, it would probably be something for the Writing Center. So I'm a, um, a fellow at our Writing Center, which is a resource where students can go to um, bring their work in any stage of the writing process and get feedback and help um, in moving forward. Um, so I'm on the outreach committee as well as a normal fellow and I work with our pedagogical journal which is called Tortoise because slow and slow steady wins the race. Yeah. Um, so we're in process of kind of getting everything together for um, our online publication so I probably would be in the writing center in one of those capacities. What's a pedagogical journal for those who aren't well versed in pedagogical journals? Yeah um, so basically we publish excerpts from student written pieces with a focus on what they've done well in writing those pieces like whether they've done really good close, close reading or have a really good introduction and the focus is to have students be able to go to the journal and look at good examples of really good writing and why the writing is good so that you can be like taught how to write better yourself. Ooh, that's good. So maybe someone who's working on their essays too. Like, could they, do you think that would be a good resource is like maybe most people wouldn't know about to check out? Yeah, um, I definitely, um, it's tortoise.princeton.edu is our website. Um, and it's just like really good writing tips. Well, and now let's go to Ben. People call you Ben, right? But you're Benjamin. Do you go by Ben or Benjamin? 
Uh, more people at Princeton tend to call me Ben. More people in Tennessee tend to call me Benjamin. So it's Ben, ben as it stands right now. Right. Okay, well, we'll go with Ben. So Ben, uh, thank you so much for being here again. I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, and uh, I, was, I didn't tell everybody how to dress. And I just love the fact that you look nice. Not that you, you, you ladies look fantastic. You look wonderful as well. Um, but you're wearing a tie and I'm not. But the fact like you just show up with a tie, man, like when in doubt, wear a tie, right? <laughs> That's usually, I tend to go over it instead of underdressed if I have to risk being uh, above, the, above the median. Yeah, and it, does that work out for you typically? Uh, not always, but uh, more more than uh, more than I think it would if I went for under instead. So, so ben, I, I, is there an example where you overdressed for an occasion and felt awkward or uncomfortable? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, the um, let's see, the art museum had what I had interpreted to be a gala, and it was not. It was a whole bunch of people very casually getting t-shirts and just sort of <laughs> hanging out, and I was tremendously overdressed uh, and very, very visible. Um, yeah. So it, it has not always worked out. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it, you, you could always pretend like you work there. Uh, True, I, you know, there's there, there's ways around it. I, right. I wasn't quite that quick in that moment. I was a little right. off guard. But I, I appreciate that. And it says a lot about you. I'm grateful to have you here. So 448, it's 448, Ben. It's, it's a normal day at Princeton in April. What are you doing? Where are you, man? All right, well, I'm probably walking back from my last class because that tends to go over a bit. Um, what last, um, what's that last class? Uh, it's a seminar on John Milton. Uh, and so we'd probably be, at this point, we'd be reading through some of the end of Paradise Lost. And then I will be walking back probably to run to my dorm before uh, I get a quick dinner because uh, I usually have to eat dinner a little earlier on Wednesdays to make a shift later in the evening for the newspaper. So what uh, dorm is this that you live in? Uh, I live in Bloomberg Hall. So I live on one of the dorms that's farther south on campus. So it can be a little bit longer of a walk from mm -hmm. uh, most of the buildings I have class in. And um, you are, are you a sophomore now or? I'm a junior. You're a junior. And uh, are you still friends with your roommate from freshman year? Um. In a way, yes. I didn't have a roommate freshman year because I was in a single where I was, but I am still very good friends with my neighbor uh, from freshman year. We still talk and run into each other plenty, and we still live kind of in the same area, so we still see each other fairly frequently. Nice, and that's Bloomberg? What was the hall? Bloomberg? Uh, Bloomberg Hall, yes. So explain to us, for people who are interested in going to Princeton and the, you know, people who are going to live on campus, what's the residential community like? And anybody can jump in just to kind of give a sense. Because I know it, I just talked to some students from Yale and they have their you know, residential houses. It's kind of like Harry Potter a little bit. Um, but is that, is that like that at Princeton? Princeton, Princeton has something similar. So we're divided into residential colleges. There are six right now. They're working on building more whenever that ultimately ends up happening. I'm sure their time frame is a little messed up right now. But uh, they have uh, six different colleges. Uh, Bloomberg Hall is part of Butler College, uh, which is the one I'm affiliated with. And those residential colleges, you stay in for your first two years at Princeton. And then for some, you have the option to stay there all four years or go into upperclassmen housing or something like that. They provide okay. pretty good resources for getting acclimated to campus. Uh, all that good stuff. Right. And then Paige, uh, were you, were, are you still in the same residential college? So I actually um, started in Wilson um, my freshman and sophomore years. Um, and then now I'm in Maddie College because I joined something called the Edwards Collective, um, mm -hmm. which is a artist and humanist living community. So it's essentially a few floors in Edwards Hall in Maddie College, um, made up of people who are interested in the arts and humanities, and you apply um, to be a part of this this collective. And we just live together, have brunch together on the weekends, go to support each other's shows, go into New York to see shows together. Mm. It's a it's a really great group. That oh, sounds amazing. It sounds incredible. Are you still friends with your your first year roommate? Yeah, um, I had five roommates my wow. first year. Um, we were in a suite of six, but we all had our own room. Um, it was like six singles and then one bathroom, like very sweet style. 
Um, and so I'm closer with some of them than others because y you're not gonna be best friends with all, <laughs> all five of your, your roommates. Right. But um, I definitely used to keep in touch with some of them. And one of them, we always check in with each other and we right. consider her a good friend. Did you pick who you were living with or did they just throw you into a room with five other people? <laughs> a little bit the second. Um, you fill out a kind of survey um, with your habits, like what time you go to bed. How what are your habits, you are. Paige? Oh, gosh. Uh, night owl. I'm oh. always up late. Yeah. How late? Um, uh, 2 a.m. Okay. 3 a.m. on bad nights. Do you go to class? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> Some people don't, though, right, Ben? Uh, some, <laughs> Why do I pick some, ben? <laughs> some things are easier to miss than others, you know. But uh, I, I'm, I know, in my case, I'm lucky enough to have been able to schedule eventually to not have too many morning classes. So I, uh, a night owl myself, am able to sleep in a little more and uh, avoid some nine a.m.s. Yeah, those are brutal. People think that those are good ideas, like you know, when they're when they're like in high school, they're like, I can do it. But no, it's not a good idea, right? Uh, Kate, tell me about you. Your your first year, did you live with someone, a stranger? Um, I was in a quad, so there are three other people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, we were both in like, so it was like doubles. So I was with one person in a very small room with bunk beds. Um, I really wasn't close to any of my roommates freshman year. We kind of all just were going our own directions. We didn't completely click. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just see them every once in a while. Um, but one of them who wasn't my direct roommate, I lived with this year. Um, and yeah, I was still in the same residential college, which I was in Rockefeller, or we call it Rocky. Um, Rocky. And yeah, so I'm in a quad again this year with three other people. But Did you pick them? This year. So yeah, once you get to your sophomore year, you can pick your yeah. roommates. Um, I was hoping to get a single, but sadly, Rockefeller College doesn't have very many singles. And my time was pretty low on the list. So I ended up with a group of people who are definitely not my like closest friends, but they're really nice and like we get along. So it works. Um, hopefully next yeah. year, I'm going to have more of my own space. <laughs> yeah. Well, that stinks to want a single, then be stuck in a quad. That's the opposite of a single. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, if you're thinking you're going to be in a single, Ben was in a single. Ben, that first year when you were in a single, was it lonely, man? Were you able to connect? Cause I mean, I know Kate, you didn't get along with your roommates that well. I'm, I'm kind of par. I, I, Actually, you didn't say you didn't get along, but my sense is there was some drama. And as we get to know each other, we can like, you can share some of the dirt. But like, there was drama, right, Kate? A little bit, a tiny bit. <laughs> There's a lot of drama. And you got, but you got through it, or a tiny bit. I don't want to contradict you, okay? Um, but there was a tiny bit. So it, it can be uncomfortable, but you made it through, right? But then the opposite is being a first year student living alone which I, I really discourage that. And, you know, Ben, you might have had a great experience and think it's a great idea, but um, what are your thoughts on, on living alone your first year as opposed to being thrust into a situation with a total stranger? You know, th there were definitely some drawbacks to it. Going into it, a single was what I wanted. I am the kind of person who likes to, when need be, sort of isolate himself. But yeah. it is very easy to overindulge in that. Um, and I think uh, one of the ways Princeton tries to mitigate that is your, like, kind of freshman year hall or the people nearest to you are your Z groups. And they try to have your residential college advisor, your RCA, it's basically right. an RA in most places uh, to try to help bond you together. But like the best piece of advice I got from her was if you are going to isolate yourself as much as possible, no one is going to stop you because no one really can. And so you do have to take that extra step to be very intentional about meeting people and seeing people and stuff like that in a way that happens perhaps a little more organically if you're not living alone. Yeah. And that took me a while to learn. I figured it out eventually, but it was definitely a slow start to that, I think. It's uncomfortable uh, to be in a new place. Uh, clearly, you are probably really uh, in a good place being isolated now. I, I mean, I, I did get some practice, although honestly, you know, with my, with my brother living in the you know, room next door, I'm probably less isolated than I would be in a, a single at Princeton. So. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's interesting to, um, to know that you had that experience and, and you're very involved and you're all very involved. Uh, I want to get into some of the places where you made your friends. Are you, are you all friends? Just nod your head if you're all friends. Are you all friends? 
the three of you? Are you friends? I don't yeah, know okay, Ben sure. super I, well, but. You don't know Ben? I don't know Ben super well. I've seen him in shows and we've seen each other oh. like, in situations. We've been in auditions together. But well, this is great, Kate. Is there something you want to know about Ben while we're here? <laughs> um, not really. I loved him in um, Godspell and, you know, so yeah. What was his role in Godspell? Oh, I, I do not remember. I can't remember. I know there's the two. I, right. There's yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, Judas, and everybody else. And I was one of the everybody else. You were one of everyone else. Was there anything in particular in, in, in terms of Ben's performance that really stood out? I was just watching some of the videos from that show, actually. Oh, God. Oh, we should link to the videos. Are they on YouTube? <laughs> there's, a video, there's a video on YouTube, actually, that I just posted. With Ben? Um, yeah, I think he's in it. Oh, will you share that afterwards? We'll include that yeah. in the description. Yeah. It's a montage of some of the shows that Paige and I do in our theater company. Oh, nice. You know, I was watching a video of... Um, it was the, it's the, um, what is it? The, the, the university, not the university players, the, um, oh, the, oh, what is it? The, um, what's it? The triangle. Yeah. Um, I was watching this really cool video, which I should also link to. I have to make these notes because I want to make sure. So Kate, really get, I'd love that, that link. Ben, if you're cool with that, you know, oh, sure. we'll get to see you do your thing. Um, <laughs> and um, it was really cool because the triangle, are any of you in triangle? Yeah, I That's am. you. Okay. Um, so it was this video from 2019 where it was you guys going across the country and taking the show from one place to another. Were you part yeah. of that, Kate? Yeah, I was there that year last year. My really good friend made that vlog of the whole tour experience. We go on tour every year. Yeah, that was super fun. This yeah. year was even more fun, though, because we were in Florida and it was like really nice weather. Yeah. So just explain real quickly. And, and I know I've got some questions I want to get to, but just as long as I mention that, if a student wants to get involved with Triangle, um, how do they get involved? What does Triangle do? Did you get rejected a bunch of times before you got in? Um, just give me this, give me the scoop. Yeah, sure. Um, so Triangle's like this musical comedy group and it's been around for like 130 years now. So it's very like lots of tradition, a lot of alumni who are very passionate about it. Um, and it kind of originated actually as like the theater group on campus, on Princeton's campus, and then kind of became its own separate thing. Um, but yeah, we, our students, part of the writers of our club, write a, original musical comedy every year, which is like super cool and like doesn't really happen that many other places. Um, and they, they write it, usually it's either like a book show or it's like a review and we put it on every November and then we take it on tour to go visit a lot of alumni across America in January. And then we do a smaller show that the writers also write in the spring. And then they start to write the show for the next fall. It's like a full, they just keep, it's always happening. There's always something happening. Um, but yeah, if people like, pre, what's cool about triangles, there's a way for literally anyone with any skill set to be involved because we have five sides of Triangle cast, writers, pit, orchestra, our tech team, and our business team. So if you are interested in building things or you're dealing with money or marketing or you want to perform or dance or whatever, like there's a place for you. Um, the only part that's like audition based is the writers and the cast. Um, those two are pretty competitive. I definitely know, I luckily wasn't rejected, um, but definitely people like have, a trouble getting into the club initially if they especially if they want to be in cast um it's a little it definitely is just a competitive process because we have yeah. professional directors and professional choreographers come in and they're the ones who are mainly casting gotcha. and usually they're coming in not even really knowing that much about princeton students so yeah but so they're not playing favorites they're just picking what they think is the right like, yeah whatever yeah. they think is going to be the best yeah. for that show but yeah yeah hey Paige, have you ever participated in triangle no um I've done a lot of other theater on campus, but I'm an avid viewer of the Triangle show because a lot of my <laughs> friends are involved. And seeing a Triangle show is its own experience because there's a lot of traditions with like how to view a Triangle show as an audience member. Like how would I view it? Yeah, so there's every freshman like orientation period, there's the Frosh Week show, which is like essentially like the greatest hits of Triangle. It's like these, these sketches and songs that have just been like in the books for years. 
And as an audience member, everyone's like so riled up and brownie. <laughs> we throw a bunch of paper airplanes at the stage when the show starts. There's all these oh. like call and responses that you, so it's like it's just a really great experience. Like even if you're not in it, you feel like you're a part yeah. of it because you're participating in the audience. Oh, that's great. And then Ben, I know that you're involved with the Princetonian. You're very involved, right? That's, yes. the, that's the, the, daily, the daily Princetonian, correct? That's yes, awesome. very involved. Have you ever covered the Triangle Show? Uh, I have not, personally. I know we've tried, uh, we're trying to revitalize our arts and culture section. Uh, yeah. We call it The Prospect. Uh, Paige is a writer and editor for it as well. Um, and so we are trying to do more things that are show-centric, uh, but I, I have not covered a Triangle Show myself. Right, right. But there's always there's there's always a time. It's nice to see that you're interested in doing that. That could be something we could all set up. Uh, the the uh, the deep the deep dig into the Triangle Show. Uh, so, I want to get to know a little bit about you and why you chose Princeton. So I'm curious, Ben. Did you really want to go to Princeton? Like, where did you really want to go? Let's be honest. <laughs> well, I. Uh to be honest. At the beginning, I wasn't really, I didn't really think I had a shot. Um, I, Princeton wasn't very much on, even on my radar until the beginning of my senior year, um, where uh, among, among my high school's flaws, one of the things they did fairly well is they had two very, very good college counselors. Um, and one of them told me about Princeton's Arts and Humanities Symposium, uh, and uh, told me about how it, it was this program, like if you end up getting into it, they fly you up and you're, you effectively have a tour of campus and you do a few workshops for about two days. And, you know, I, again, not having to pay for the plane ticket was also a draw. And so I said that that sounded interesting. We'll see how that goes. And I got in and got to go to that and really loved it and really enjoyed the campus. Um, and then after that, I realized that, uh, Princeton's early action program was the only early pro uh, was the only program where I was applying where their early program wasn't binding. Uh, and since I didn't really know what my family's finances would look like, you know, a year from now, a year or a year from then, sure. um, I thought that it was the best early program to go for. So I, I gave it a shot and got to get in. And I did, I did plenty of deliberating. I was waffling until the last minute. I won't lie. It seemed kind of big and scary to me and something where I didn't know really many people who'd gone to an Ivy League, let alone Princeton, before. And so it was this kind of big unknown for me, but I, I ultimately decided that it was where I was supposed to be. So Yeah, cool. And to provide some context, so you're from Franklin, Tennessee. You went to Battleground Academy. Um, tell me a little bit about your high school, the makeup, that community, so other people who maybe aren't similar places can get a sense of, of where you're from. Sure. So uh, Battleground is a small, uh, relatively small private school. It's a K through 12 school. And I went there my whole, my whole, you know, ed educational career prior to college. Yeah. So uh, all, all K through 12. Um, it, it was a fairly small community. Um, a, a lot of the teachers there were very helpful in, uh, you know, helping me find kind of direction and what I wanted to continue on with in, in life. It doesn't usually graduate people into Princeton or Ivy Leagues horribly frequently. Um, I knew someone from uh, the year before me who had gone to Harvard, and then the last person who had gone to Ivy League that I knew of was about five years ago and was graduating Princeton my senior year. And so right when I got in, the, the college counselor set me up on a coffee date with him. And that was super helpful because I got to speak to him and say, you're the only person who can tell me that this will work. Um, so I need, I need to hear it from you. Yeah, uh, but, that's yeah. really scary. It's scary to be from a smaller community where people don't go on this path um, and to be in a place where you've lived your entire life and then to be thrown into this place with such culture and there's people who are legacies and and you know know the campus really well um, when you first arrived um, like how did you do that man like how did you how did you make that transition and, and was it hard for you 
it was it was definitely i mean it was a shift um i had again gone to the same school for 13 years lived in the same house for 18 you know change was it something i was opposed to it just wasn't something that had happened and so i think uh my my main coping strategy for getting adjusted was bothering everyone with questions anytime I could. I'm sure I was an unholy nuisance to my RCA that year, but I was I was just uh, attempting to navigate uh, as well as I could by asking as many questions as I could uh, yeah. on arrival and talking to people because at, immediately when you get into Princeton and you get into Z group and you go on uh, either outdoor action or community action, which we can talk about in a bit, um, you immediately meet people with experiences vastly different from your own. And some of them know more about Princeton and some of them know just as little as you. Um, and so that I think was also very helpful is not just talking to the people who are appointed as resources for you, but also with the people who, you know, you're in it together. Yeah, having that wide range of views from different people, uh, that's, that's really wonderful. So. I want to get to to Kate and Paige. I want to I want to ask you to the question of of if you want to go to Princeton. But I also want to know, Ben, um, did you get rejected from other schools, or did you just apply your early decision to Princeton and nothing else? Uh, no, I did. I got uh, I got rejected from uh, from another school I was waiting on. Which one? I love rejection because I think you're also awesome, and I love. You know, people love watching the rejection. They love college decision videos because they love to see like, oh, these people are so smart and, you know, they got rejected too. Um, are you comfortable sharing where you didn't get in? Sure. Uh, I did not get into Swarthmore uh, was one. I was waitlisted initially and then rejected. Um, yeah. And then uh, I hadn't applied to that wide of a range. So I, I got accepted to the other, I believe it was six other schools I, I applied. On the other Ivies? Uh, no, Princeton was the only Ivy I applied to. And you probably, can you couldn't believe you got in? I was, yeah, no, I was, it, like, I came out of, I came out of my <laughs> December AP Euro exam, opened my laptop to check, saw the acceptance note, and, like, kind of looked around. Most people had <laughs> left at that point to, like, is there someone here I can tell? <laughs> um, and I tracked down a friend of mine who's, girlfriend couldn't drive and so he was stuck there so I was like ha captive audience and so I uh, <laughs> got to got to rant to rant to them for a while uh, so it was a miracle it, it, it was it was not what I expected again and there are plenty of people who were around me who were like yeah I totally knew and I okay. I think they're lying they didn't know I didn't know no one knew how this was going to work out but. right it just worked out well it'll be interesting to find out why so Kate uh, do you, did you want to go to Princeton is this your first choice um it was my first choice by the time I actually applied um me getting to that point of applying to Princeton was interesting I um, went to a performing arts high school. And so I very much was on the path of like, okay, I want to do theater for the rest of my life. I should go to a BFA like everyone else. Um, and I kind of was thinking about that path. I then went to a program the summer before my, uh, the fall of my senior year. And I was at a program that was like this BFA intensive program for two weeks. And by the end of the first week, I was like, nope, I am not supposed to be at a BFA. Um, Why is that? And for those who don't know what BFAs are, can you yeah. explain that? Bachelor of Fine Arts. So like those programs are very specific for an arts specific major. You're pretty much spending your whole time doing art stuff. Um, and so doing a BFA in musical theater seemed like the right choice. But after a week of that program, I just realized I, especially after high school, being around so many theater people, I was like, I love theater people to death. I love this community. I love doing theater. But I was realizing that I didn't want my entire day to just be one thing. Mm -hmm. And that I was getting very exhausted and just, dr I felt drained um, from doing mu the musical theater and theater that much without having like, I felt like I wasn't having any conversations about anything else. Um, and I was like, I want to be at a school where I have, I take classes and I do all these things with people who don't know anything about theater. And I can talk to about something completely different. Um, and so that's what I kind of realized that I wanted to be at a school where I could still do theater and be oh. in that community if I wanted to but I didn't have to oh. be all the time. So uh, that's so interesting because for many years you thought you were going to be doing one thing, yeah. but then you actually experienced it and realized it wasn't what you wanted. Yeah. And what was the, like when you were a sophomore, um, just give us like a glimpse into what you thought 
you know, you're three years down the line, like where did you think you would be? And what did you think you would be doing? And you could use names and specifics because it's kind of yeah. kind of interesting to, to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I always, I think I thought I was going to go to a, maybe a liberal arts school, but maybe a smaller liberal arts school where I could actually major in theater and spend most of my time doing that. And um, where I didn't have to necessarily take like all the liberal arts classes, not in the same way that at Princeton, you can't even take right. theater as a major. Um, or I thought I was going to be at like Carnegie or Michigan or like one of those schools I probably never would have gotten into, but like thought that that was going to be the path because it was what a lot of the seniors at my high school were doing. Right. Um, and, and you are from, you're from Brooklyn. You went to LaGuardia yeah. High School for Music, Arts, and Performing Arts. So you're surrounded by a lot of artists. So you didn't yeah. think you would get into Michigan or Carnegie? I mean, it's just so competitive. That's even more competitive. Isn't Princeton as competitive? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, more. Even it's so. more. And it's also not even, you don't need, it's not even based off of your application. It's based off of the five minutes you're in a room in front of someone and how well you sing a song in that minute and how they think they know you in those three minutes or five minutes. Um, so it's crazy. And like, that's also what I realized. Like, I wanted to be an accepted to a school just based off of my holistic, just yeah. interests, not just my audition for five minutes. Did you have to sing for Princeton? Did you have to do that for Princeton as well? Um, you definitely don't have to. I remember I sent like an art supplement, which I did for most of my liberal arts applications just to be like, hey, theater department, like I'm coming to you. Um, <laughs> so I sent kind of a video that I had actually filmed as my pre-screens for Michigan and Carnegie. I had done all the pre-screens and I sent a bunch of those videos as my art supplements when I ended up doing liberal arts. Did you apply to Michigan and Carnegie as well? I started the process and I did not finish any of them. <laughs> huh, you don't, you didn't, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, ben, did you have to sing for anyone? I did not and I'm sure they're all thankful. Um, <laughs> not true, not true. I, I have improved since. I have, I, the, the, back, in, back in high school, my, my singing abilities were less. They're still not fantastic, but we're, we're working towards. Right, towards things. And, then, and, then, and then Paige, or actually, I, I don't want to leave off. Kate, did you, did you get accepted to other schools and rejected from other schools as well? Um, I got rejected from Brown and I got into UVA and um, Barnard at Columbia. Oh, really? Interesting. Because I think a lot of people, you know, look at Columbia and, and UVA. I mean, the great places. Was it hard to make this decision? Um, no, I applied to Princeton early, so I was planning on applying to a whole, whole other list of schools, and the only two I ended up applying to after I got into Princeton were Brown and Barnard. Okay. So my, cool. it was pretty easy for me. Once I got into Princeton, I was like, yep, that's, I'm meant to be there. <laughs> right. A lot of people want to know how to get in, so I have another question with that, but, I, but Paige, I want to know, uh, was Princeton your first choice? Did you not get into some schools where you were crying? Like, I'd love to hear about some tears and some tough situations, just because you know, heartbreak's part of this process. Yeah, um, so it's interesting that both of the people here got in early to Princeton because um, my experience is a little different. Um, Princeton was my first choice until it wasn't. Um, in mm. October of my freshman, uh, not my freshman, in October of my um, senior fall, I had this kind of crisis of identity and I was like, is Princeton actually my first choice? I don't think it is, I think it's Yale. Um, and then I like convinced myself that Yale was my first choice. Part of it was like some things I read online. Some of it was Yale. What did you, this is great. I want to like, give us some specifics on why you were so wrong. And like, you know, we, I just had a Yale conversation. Yale's great. Like all these schools are great. And it's really each person's own experience. So it's yeah. not like, you know, there's nothing disparaging. It's just you processing as a high school student, convincing yourself of something like just like, what are some specifics so other people can identify with that? Yeah. Um, so I can, I was like, Yale has this incredible drama school, like Yale school of drama. Um, and I was like, I want to be near that. Like, obviously that's a MFA, a master's program, but I was like, I want to be somewhere where they have such a great resource and um, I also, Yale, you can double major and you can't double major at Princeton. And at the time I was convinced that I wanted to double major because I had a lot of different interests and I thought I was going to double major. And the, Yale also has some really incredible just interdisciplinary majors, um, like their College of Letters and things like that, where I was like, that's, that's me. I think I want those specific programs. 
So I applied early to Yale, but submitted my Princeton application on the same day, early, but like for regular decision. I don't know why I was crazy, but I had finished the Princeton application too. So I was like, I just need to get this out of my hands. And maybe if they see that it came in so early, they'll know that I'm like at least like interested in, but it's not an early application. So I applied early to Yale um, and then got deferred, which I think was actually the best thing to happen to me because if I got early in Yale, there's a good chance I would have just like fallen in love with it then because right. I would have had the yes, I would have had it. So then I ended up applying to a total of 14 schools after oh, I got wow. deferred from Yale. When um, Let's hit the pause button when you get deferred. Did anybody else get deferred? I think with, with either of you, no. So that's very common. And when you got deferred, were you crying? Were you devastated? Were you, were you, you know, your whole life was uprooted and there was a big question mark with your, with your future? Yeah, um, well, the good thing about the deferral is it's not, it's not a no. Um, it just means not right now. Kind of like um, the friend zone, though. It's like a little yeah, bit. You know. Yeah, that's a good way. <laughs> it's kind of like a, ooh. Um, we like you, guess, but we can't really date you. Yeah. And I guess what disappointed me about it was like all the work that then was ahead of me. Because then yeah. it was like, okay, I'm actually going to apply to 14 different schools. And because that was a maybe. Why 14, Paige? That's so many schools. Yeah. Because yeah. so many of them are so competitive and I had no way of knowing, I had no way of knowing whether I was going to get into any of them. So you were scared. So I applied to a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Because that seems like a lot because, I mean, even if you have like a safety, you know, you have like one or two safeties and a few reach, but like 14, do you recommend applying to that many schools? It was a lot. I, I have to say it was a lot. Um, but I was applying to like five different Ivies, a few different like very competitive small liberal arts colleges. And then like I had like three safeties that I felt more convinced on. And I would say maybe 10 is, is like actually a good number. Um, right. if, if, if a lot of them are rich right. schools. Um, but I just, I can't make a decision. So I applied to 14. <laughs> Did you make, did you make a decision? Did you make one of those videos where like your, your reaction video? Cause 14, that'd have been a good video. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I didn't. <laughs> okay. So we have to run through this and, and, you know, forgive me, Kate and Ben, I just need to know, like, are you, are you curious to know where Paige applied and whether she got in or not? I kind of am. <laughs> Kate wants to know. She's like all over this. Okay. She's so smart. So I think. Yeah, she, oh, do you know, before Paige, before P you tell us Paige, Kate, I would like you to describe Paige and tell me Paige's best qualities. What makes Paige just such a bright light? One, she's like one of the best leaders I've ever come across, ever. She's taken on like things at Princeton that like people usually don't take on until they're seniors. And she took them on when she was like, a f like in her spring of freshman year and sophomore. Um, and she's, but she doesn't lead with this like idea, like she doesn't lead with this mentality of like, I'm better than you or I'm in power here. Like she leads with this sense of like, I'm leading a community that we're all gonna work together. And also, yeah, that was me working with her in that capacity is amazing to me to watch her. She's really a role model to me as a great leader because it's not about her being the most important or having the most power. It's about being there for everybody and fostering this really amazing community. She also is just incredibly supportive and very intelligent and, um, yeah, I mean, she's a brilliant theater maker and lovely, bright, shining. She loves God. I love God. I mean, a lot of things. But yeah, we connect on many levels, Paige. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a beautiful description. Ben, you know Paige pretty well. Also, can you, can you tell me a little bit about Paige? Paige, are you comfortable with this? I should have asked you first. <laughs> I'm like overwhelmed. <laughs> and it's nice to have that. And, and, but Ben, you can also be, does Ben have permission to be brutally honest? Oh yeah. To, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I, I had too much to be critical of, to be entirely honest with you. Pa Paige was one of the first, Paige was one of the first people at Princeton I got to meet. Uh, she and I were on the same community action trip. 
Um, and so like she was part of my first introduction to that. And that was also something that was really, really comforting to me because like one of the first things we talked about were like experiences in high school theater. So I was like, okay, cool. I have a conversation starter. Like I, I have some kind of language with which to engage these strange alien people who are in New Jersey. Uh, you know, like that, that was something that was really comforting to me, but like, and this is, stealing plenty from what Kate has already said, but uh, she has the ability to make people so comfortable in so many different contexts. Like I, I've, wor I've been with Paige in both like the informal community action context, like in English classes, in a journalistic context and in theater, like in all these different realms, but she, she carries herself in a way that like just makes you feel like you're more at home. Uh, and I think that's a really good quality to a person and something you don't see a lot. Um, yeah, that's really, that, that's, that's really wonderful. So Paige, now that we know who you are and that you are so competent in so many ways and have had such a amazing impact on at least two of the people here and I'm sure so many other people, uh, where did you apply? Where did you get rejected? Give us the dirt. Yeah, um, gosh, um, I might not remember all of them, but I applied to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Penn, um, Tell us with each one, did you get in or didn't you? Let's just go through the list. Yeah, um, so I got into Princeton, Yale, and Penn. Those Princeton, ended up being... Yeah. Oh, so you did get into Yale after being deferred. I did. I did got to get in after deferral. But okay. by that point, Princeton had stolen my heart again. So. <laughs> wow. So Princeton, Yale, and Penn. So those are great choices. And um, so you were relieved. Where did you not get in? I was waitlisted at Harvard and Columbia. Interesting. And did they ever let you in? No, um, because I, I took myself off. Like once I, once I decided Princeton, you have to like let them know that you decided. Yeah. Okay. So, so that I never was got like fully rejected from anywhere, but there, okay. there's a chance I would have never, never gotten into Harvard or Columbia. So. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The rejection piece and, and for people who don't know me, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty like harsh with the rejection stuff and asking. I think rejection is the hardest part of being a human being. Um, and especially when you are a very, uh, you know, clearly you are at the top of your classes and whether you were number one, two, three, four, or five, it just doesn't matter uh, because clearly there was a reason why you are where you are and we can get to that reason. But the rejection piece of, you know, how do you deal with rejection? And when you do get into a school like Princeton, and then you're around all these aliens, like you were saying, Ben, and, and you're having new experiences and you don't know people, uh, you sometimes don't feel worthy or you start to question yourself, you have that imp imposter syndrome. Uh, did imposter syndrome hit any of you when you arrived at school? And, and, and how do you deal with that? Ben, you're smiling. Oh no, that, that's absolutely, there is, it's very easy to believe, and it's probably the most wrong thing you will go in believing, but it is very easy to believe that everyone there has it together but you, and the, the truth is the exact opposite. Almost no one has it together, and most of the ones who seem like it do are either intentionally or unintentionally just better liars than you are, um, and like that, that's something that it takes a second to wrap your head around. Um, but no, that, that absolutely happens. It, it still happens. It just yeah. What about you, Kate? Is, has, have you felt, you know, not good enough, questioned your abilities, especially, you know, you, you obviously are a very talented uh, musician, I would, I would imagine, singer, performer, and there's a lot of people who are really talented and you question, you know, am I, am I that good? Is that, has that happened to you? Definitely. Um, when I, I got to Princeton, the main thing, though, that I felt imposter syndrome with was like coming from my high school, like most of the money and most of the effort at my high school was put into the arts. Um, and I didn't get a great education academically. Part of the reason I ended up wanting to apply to school like Princeton, because I wanted that. But when I got to Princeton, I was like, wow, everyone already has a better education than I do. Like I just felt unprepared for college in a lot of ways and for college level writing, college level math, like everything academically. Um, so that was a huge thing that like, honestly, probably is true in a lot of ways. And I kind of had to deal with and just being like, no, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to work my butt off and like, get to where I feel good about myself and my education and like what I want to learn. And it doesn't matter how I'm on track or where I came from versus other people. Yeah. Did you get any um, so yeah, C's, D's really or F's or that first yeah. semester? Did you get any C's or D's or? or I, had really, I had trouble in writing seminar, which is the freshman 
class that a lot of people struggle with. So I wasn't alone in that, but that was definitely a struggle. I think what ended up happening was like, I actually ended up grade wise doing a lot better than I expected. I think that just where I feel like the most out of place is I can work and get the work done to get a good grade, but just in general knowledge about the world, literature knowledge, a lot of things yeah. that I think people just kind of gain along the way. I definitely in conversation sometimes even at Princeton, I'm like, wow, this person yeah. is so smart. They're bringing so much intelligence to this conversation. And yeah. Yeah, I feel stupid. I felt very dumb for many years. Um, I, I, I struggled. I wasn't, uh, I didn't go to an Ivy League school and I was like a 2.9 student. I failed freshman algebra. Um, end up doing all right, but um, you know, I, I never felt good enough, and it's a really scary thing. I think, and, and I wonder if this is true. A lot of times, when when you're at a place like Princeton, even though the world says, "Wow, like you're exceptional," you know, the pain of not feeling good enough when you're surrounded by your peers. Um, you know, is that something that that you run into, Paige, or seen with students that you work with in the writing center? Yeah. Um... I felt it a lot my freshman year related to kind of extracurricular activities um, as I auditioned for groups or applied to be part of things. Um, I think a lot of Princeton life is application based. Like you think it ends and then it doesn't. It's, it's because everybody's so great that there's, there has to be some kind of cutoff or else like every group would be like 250 people. Um, <laughs> But my, like, my, my first fall at Princeton, I didn't get into a lot of the groups that I had like my heart set on. Oh, good. Tell us about some of the ones. Tell us about that. Because right now, just for context, again, like Paige, you know, like you're president of University Players, uh, an Orange Key tour guide. You write for the Princetonian. You're a Writing Center Fellow. You are editor of the Tortoise. You're a member of the Berman Undergraduate Society of Fellows, member of the Edwards Collective a student intern for Wellesley Foundation, um, an inclusive progressive Christian group rooted in Methodist tradition, which I love spiritual groups. So, and I'm mentioning these all because I want people to know about them, not just to elevate you, but um, these are so cool. Um, and also a member of the advisory council for the English department. So um, it might've been good that you got rejected freshman year because you do a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Was, there, was, was there one or two that like, that really upset you or shook you? Yeah, um, the first like theater productions I auditioned for, I just yeah. like didn't get in. Um, mm -hmm. There was a play with theater on team called Arcadia. I didn't get in. I didn't get into shows at the department. Um, and then I auditioned for some improv groups. Our improv groups are fantastic on campus. I love them so much. Um, big shout out to them. I have a lot of friends. Um, but yeah. Fuzzy Dice and Quipfire, the, at the time, the two audition based groups only take one or two people each year but I I was I even got to callbacks for one of them and then I just didn't get in and it was kind of like whoa I thought like college was going to be the time I was going to like step into my own as a theater person because in, in high school I felt like I was balancing a million different things and I had dropped a lot of that away going into college um, and then it was like nope you're not it turns out there were going to be a lot of other opportunities and I ended up having a very full year by freshman year but during those first two weeks you think you have to figure out your entire time like yeah. everything's auditioning and you're like this is it if I don't get in in these first two weeks then I'm done and I'll never have anything right and it's not like that there's lots of time and um what about this when you don't get what you want talking to the people who make the decisions to try and understand what you need to do. Is that something that any of you have done or, or do? Or did you do that page? Like when you didn't get in saying, you know, what, what can I do to get in or, you know, having a relationship even beyond the no. Yeah. I don't think I had the confidence to do that my first year, yeah. but I've built that confidence more. Um, like right now I'm uh, like, I feel like now I have more of the confidence to go back and kind of say, um, like, what exactly were you looking for? Or can you explain to yeah. me, like, how I can improve? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a hard thing. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to do that. I think a lot of people, a lot of people struggle with that. Um, when it comes to um, your love life, are any of you in love right now? I'd say, yeah, I'd say so. Oh, there's some love here. This is good. So, so Ben, you have a little love in your life. Indeed. 
And, um, and, and Paige, you have some love in your life right now? Oh, no, I was just pointing at Ben. <laughs> oh, I was, I, was being, I was being. I was calling oh. him out. <laughs> so you two are so, Kate, are you in a relationship right now? Nope. You're single? Yes. Available? <laughs> yeah. Right, and Paige, you as well? Nobody. Right, yes. you never know. Someone may watch us and be like, you know, these people are amazing. I'd love to get to know them better, you know, b besides... Um, but Ben, so you're, you're in a, and we don't have to declare your love, but, um, did you find your significant other at Princeton? I did. Yes. Ben, can you share how you met this person? Cause I, I want to understand if Princeton is a, a hookup culture, if it's a dating culture, if it's a big, you know, if you have to party to meet people. Um, I know it's a lot of different questions <laughs> wrapped up in one, but how did you meet your significant other? Uh, so I met Anna actually through the newspaper, uh, through the prints. Um, she, uh, I met her uh, May of last year. Mm. Um, and or I guess I met, we started dating in May, met her uh, in April. And she was one of the few people who actually frequently attended the social events that we tried to throw. Um, and because we, we were trying to, as kind of the newspaper leadership, to build up that community and all of that. And it starts slow, you know, you start with the movie nights where like three other people show up and you're like, yeah, we, we can do this and built up to something. Uh, but we'd spoken uh, here and there for a while. And then, uh, I got to talking through those, uh, which was uh, really helpful. Um, and then uh, she also was in the same residential college as I was. So, you know, when you're leaving the newspaper, uh, you're walking back towards the same place and you have more time to talk there uh, and stuff like that. And so, yeah, that's, that's how we met. And we're both still involved in the paper. Oh, that's great. So it's, so it's, it happens at the paper. So is she, is she also, does she write for the paper? Um, she did a bit of opinion writing, but most of what she does is uh, she was a copy staffer back in May, and now okay. she's one of our two uh, chief copy editors. So she makes sure we're all speaking English. That's uh, great. So she can correct you, and she has strong opinions. Indeed. No, it's, it is a good, uh, I am, uh, I'm definitely have experienced a both intellectual and physical glow up since last May. I think most of my <laughs> friends can attest. That's um, amazing. Do, who made the first move? Because it's always, I'm always curious, you know, you're, you're, you're having that walk home. And, uh, and by the way, Kate and Paige, do you know Anna? Or Paige, or Kate, you don't know Ben that well. So, but Paige, you know Anna. Uh, maybe you'll get to meet Anna, Kate, at some point. I might know her. I don't know which Anna. Which Anna, Ben? Are you Anna, she, she is an on team, uh, so you might oh. have seen her some there. But um, yeah. so then, who made the first move? Was it scary for you? Did you know she liked you? Oh, Were you guys sober? I, I could never tell. She did. Like she had to kind of run it through my head a couple of times before I entirely got the message. So uh, yeah, that's that's nice. And you you two have been together for now about seven months or nine months or eight months. Uh, nearing 11 months on the 10th <laughs> not good with math i told you i struggled in math in high school so there you go uh so you've been together and then now because of the corona are you are you long distance um long ish she lives in kentucky so she's near ish again we're both under stay at home orders and stuff so like we can't see each other right now but like during the summers or during vacations when we go back home we're still able to see each other cause yeah two hour drive that's gotta suck man you're at college you're having a great time you're living your life you're what is it managing editor is that right and former head news editor i mean you got a great life dude like you're in a good place you're walking back with anna and then all of a sudden they say school's closed you all have to leave like what was going through your mind and what can you how can you i mean that's rough i was saying how can you help other people but gosh like what's hap how how'd that feel <sighs> Well, that was, it was a crazy week, uh, to say the least. All of that kind of started to go down uh, at the beginning of our midterms week, uh, which was great and got to compound with all of that. Um, and uh, it started for me uh, when we were in a meeting for the newspaper and our editor in chief was talking about how, like the different things we might have to do if we have to go online for the rest of the semester. And the rest of us were sitting there like, nah, that's, you know, like we're glad he's prepared, but that's, that's not going to happen. And then uh, later that Sunday night, there was an accidental release on the university's webpage of like plans of people not coming back uh, after spring break. And so we frantically got that breaking story out. And then the next morning they confirmed it and they said, yeah, we're, we're going to ask people to stay home. 
And then a couple days later, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday is when they gave us the official memo of, yeah, don't, don't come back. Um, that's really, that's, that's very hard. And I know I'm very lighthearted with it, but I, I really, you know, my, my heart is very heavy for all of you who have invested so much. Um, Kate, you were talking about the show that you would be doing, the tech, and I know Paige, you're, you're so involved and have so many different ways that you, you give and share. Um, how has it been, Paige, contrasting being so involved and now being isolated and having a life that's really the polar opposite? Because I think sometimes high achievers get very involved, um, and I don't know, sometimes too involved. That, that piece of how are you doing now with that time out, and how is that impacting you, and will it impact you in terms of your involvement and, and ability to have time with you? Yeah. Um... So it's actually kind of bittersweet. Um, the, the, the bitter side of it is so much is not happening now. Um, a lot of things still are happening, like online news reporting, things like that, but it's still not the same. Um, and I have definitely had to shift and figure out how to spend my time. Um, Cause I'm the type of person who'll just like work all day if, if, if I have the free time to do so. And I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't be doing that. Like at Princeton, my, the things I'm involved with would break up the day and I would go from one thing to the other and then kind of like have a balance of things. And here it's just, I'm either in class or I feel this like need to be working all the time. My junior paper deadline's coming up. Like I have, I have things that I can always be doing. So trying to kind of recenter and that, that's where the sweet part comes in. Um, because life at Princeton can get very overwhelming. And this spring was gonna be very overwhelming with my junior paper, with a lot of other extracurriculars ramping up. And there's a little bit of sweetness actually with being home and kind of getting to take a breath and be like, okay, what's actually important to me? How do I actually wanna be spending my time? Um, if I, It's really sad that all this stuff isn't happening, but how can I use this as a second to kind of like recalibrate to spend time with my family, to walk the dog together, you know, and, and just kind of using it as, as a gift, even, yeah. even though it's bad for a lot of other reasons. Yeah, I think that piece, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, the idea of being wanted and, and being desired, I think a lot of students who want to go to highly selective schools focus so much on being wanted that they, they lose sight of what they want. And I think this pause is really a wonderful time. And I think that you were saying that in, in many ways to just focus on what do you want? Like, what do you really want? And doing it while you're still in this amazing environment so that the next year you can go after what you want as opposed to being so worried about being wanted. Um, gosh, I've kept you all a while. I wanna, there's, I just have a few more questions that I just need to, to hit on because I know there are so many students who, who wanna know so many things. Um, the parting life, Kate, uh, can you be sober and, and have a good time? Is like, is, is it hard to, you know, is, is it hard to find that balance and, or does everyone have to drink and party? Um, so I've never, I have not had a single sip of alcohol since I've been at college. Um, so I definitely would say that you can have fun at college without drinking, especially at Princeton, I think. Um, I've definitely found my community of close friends who don't drink. Um, and, or people who just respect me and like, don't, don't, aren't there and going to push me or pressure me to drink. Um, it's been kind of just a personal choice that I've, for many reasons that I just didn't want to, but yeah, I mean, there, it totally is, it's totally not a thing you have to do. I know a lot of people like, that's a really fun thing that they do on Thursday nights, Friday nights, maybe Saturday nights to break up the week, to have these kind of days to look forward to, especially with the eating club system that we have at Princeton, those kind of act as the main social hub of campus. Um, and so I'm just not a person that, spe that spends a lot of time hanging out at the eating clubs at night. I'd rather have just like a chill movie night with friends. Um, and if I was to drink, like I'd rather have like, you know, some rosé with some friends watching a movie than like go and chug beer at an eating club. But it's up, you know, people can pick their... <laughs> pick their poison. They can pick what they want to do in their time. And I don't think there's a pressure one way or the other. Can someone explain real briefly what the eating clubs are and the purpose they serve for those who don't understand? And any of you are welcome to jump in and answer that real quickly. I could maybe, I, I could maybe say, um, so Ben and I are both in 
eating clubs. Kate, mm-hmm. you're, you're. I'm in tower. Oh yeah, you just joined. Sorry, we're in the same eating club, but I'm still processing that the sophomores are like in it because <laughs> right. sophomore spring was cut so short that I'm like, right. who even is in these eating clubs? Um, so they're kind of, um, we have a street on campus called Prospect Ave where all these eating clubs are. They're like mansions that have been converted into these spaces. Um, and I call them like social and eating communities for students. Um, you go there to eat your meals. They have kind of like lounge areas where you can hang out. They have like library spaces where you can study. And then on the weekends, they often throw parties and events that sometimes are just for members and sometimes are open to any Princeton students. Um, some of the eating clubs like Tower, the one that Kate and I are in are bicker clubs. So you have to go through a process where it's essentially like an interview process to get into the club. Um, where it's like speed dating with like all the members of the club and then they choose who gets to go in the club. Is it Um, hard to get in? Yes, um, it is, which is the worst part about the Bicker clubs is the, is the process of Bicker. Um, I think Tower, if it wanted to, if, if it could, it would take everybody. Um, but we, we can't like with the number of slots that are in the club. So that's kind of like the sad, the, and, they, and the, the inequality that's just perpetuated in that, that that's a remnant of kind of when these eating clubs were for like the white male rich elite that went to Princeton. That is okay. the history of the clubs, no doubt. Right. And then, uh, Ben, are you in one? I am in one. Uh, I'm in Quad, uh, the Quadrangle Club, and it is, uh, while one of the eating clubs, not one of the bicker ones, so it's a sign-in. Basically, anyone can join. They do have a cap. I don't think they've met that cap in recent memory, but they, uh, they're they basically open into anyone who can join. I've really enjoyed the community there. Uh, I was a bit late to it. Uh, most people at Princeton tend to join eating clubs their uh, sophomore year. I joined as a junior, um, so I, I stuck around in the uh, dining hall uh, residential college situation for a little bit longer than most um, but I've enjoyed who I've met so far. I wish I wished I could have enjoyed it a little longer, uh, but yeah. No. Right. So when it comes to students who are looking at finding their friends, finding their community, I like to direct them to find their places. Places are where you sweat, play, pray, live, learn, lead, love, and work. I'll say it again because it's kind of a mouthful. So places are where you sweat, play, pray, live, learn, lead, love, and work. So I would like to do a rapid fire round. And you can just tell me the, the name of the club or organization. We're going to do rapid fire, and we're going to keep going in circles till we stop, till, till we run out. Okay, it's not, there's no prizes. Uh, but if, you, if there's a student who is watching this, who's listening, who's trying to identify places at uh, Princeton where they can find connection and community, where it's accessible, I know that you're involved with a lot. But I'd, I'd, I'd like to, you to tell me the name of the, of the club or organization, and then whether or not it's open access for people who have to try out, okay? Because I know like spiritual groups, I don't think there's like a Bible study test, right? It's like, we'll take them all. No. <laughs> right. right, like uh, in the, uh, what is it, the Wellesley Foundation that you're part of? Is that? Yeah, the Wellesley Foundation, yep. What, right, that's a spiritual group where anybody can join, right? Yeah. So, sure. especially, so especially thinking, if you're a high school student who's looking at different schools, um, because I, the exercise that I like them to go through is to look at the different schools and find places at, at Yale or find places at Swarthmore or wherever it is you're interested, because the school, it, it's, school is about places, right? Like, wouldn't you agree, like, school is where you, where you sweat, play, pray, live, learn, lead, love, and work. Okay, so that's the, that's the prep. So, Kate, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, okay. Good place for first-year students, for students to find connection and community place. Um, the Princeton Triangle Club was where my first community was. And do you have to try out? Um, depends on what part of the club you're in. We cover that. Paige. Um, yeah, Princeton University Players, another theater group. Um, you do have to try out, but we have a crap load of shows, and some of them are everyone gets in no matter what. So cool. depends on the show. Ben. Uh, the Daily Bridgestonian, which I will continue to plug. Uh, there is a process of trying out, but it's not particularly selective. It's more so people get a gauge of what people's writing process is and 
some people have a lot more early journalistic experience than others. So it's more they get to know you than really an audition process. Um, My place was the Indiana Daily Student. So um, I love, I love, I love college media. All right, let's get into more. Uh, Kate, give me another. Um, Christian Union Nova is one of the Christian groups I'm a part of. No nice. audition. No audition. <laughs> Kate. The Wesley Foundation, another Christian group, no audition. <laughs> Great, Ben. Uh, I'll go with the James Madison program. It's a political and kind of sort of pre-law program on campus. You have to write a paragraph about why you want to be there, but it's not an audition. Um. Perfect. Kate, back to you. Oh, gosh. Um, the Lewis Center for the Arts. D- don't have to audition to take classes there. The faculty are super supportive. Can you may favor repeat that because our internet was a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, the Lewis Center for the Arts. It's kind of the whole center for theater, music, dance, all of it. Awesome. Paige. So I took this class called the Hume Sequence, which is a class for first years who are really interested in like deep diving in like the Western canon or whatever that is. Um, There's a huge community just around the people who have taken that class. Um, So that's not really an audition, but it's like if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Great way to meet people. Ben. Uh, the Lobster Club, which is another improv group on campus, and it's the one that does not require an audition. Anyone can join, assuming they go to enough practices. Nice. Kate, do you have another one? Anyone? Um, do any of you sweat? Let's think of anything where athletic. Or uh, you go, Kate, do we, say what you're saying. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, you're good. I was going to say the Orange, Orange Key. I'm also a tour guide. So that's a great, that is an audition process, but it's a great community. Um, and it's super fun to just kind of realize how, grateful you are for like the place you are at and talk about Princeton. Um, I would say for sweat, I love taking just the open co-curricular dance classes at the Lewis Center and those are open to anyone and you can be of any level. So those are great. Get to dance. What kind of dance? Ballet, musical theater, all of them. Perfect. Paige. Um, There are fitness classes through our gym, Dylan Gym. Um, Those are open to all students. Um, I'm a big Zumba fan. So. (laughs) You Zumba? I do. I've How been doing Zoom, Zoom Zumba now that I'm home. Zumba. <laughs> <laughs> How big are those classes? Oh, they can be, um, they're kind of just open to anyone. I would say like probably like 35 people max are, are sweating it up in the gym. Yeah. Nice. So you go to Zumba. Ben, any, any, anything else? Um, I, I mean, this overlaps a bit with what Paige was saying, but Dylan Jim also has, is just open to students in general. So not for things that are just classes, but if you want to go run on a treadmill or do something like that, I do, uh, that on occasion, probably not as frequently. (laughs) Right. That's awesome. Was there anything else? Were there any other, any other places where, cause there, we don't have, what do you, what do you call the Princeton, like, uh, newly admitted student day where people would come and walk through what, what was that called? what's it called? Princeton preview. So there's no Princeton preview. So for those who are watching this, who can't participate in Princeton preview, first of all, they could reach out to all of you and we'll have all your contact info. And you're so enthusiastic about helping and you're the opposite of rejection and you want to help, which is like such a gift and so wonderful. But is there anything that, that students can do that you'd recommend they do because they can't do, uh, but they could do virtually or try to maneuver through you know, the obstacles we're facing. Yeah, in terms of communities, they're doing actually a virtual activities fair. So if you've been accepted to Princeton, um, they're gonna be doing a virtual uh, activities fair on the Princeton 2024 Facebook page. So for uh, like a whole week, they're gonna have different clubs posting and you can then check out their websites and stuff. So if we didn't mention a club that you wanna find, that'll be there. So that's a great virtual. Do you think people who, uh, like juniors who are interested in Princeton, do you think they're going to have access to that Facebook page too? No, that's not, um, they're not going to have access to that. But I also would say the Princeton, like Otis Instagram, Princeton Instagram, there's a bunch of Instagrams right now. They're all trying to do like all these videos with current students and like resources. Those are open to anybody. Those are great. Um, And also Otis, Otis's website lists all the different clubs, which is the, yeah. Yeah, and I believe that Princeton's trying to get like a virtual preview site that will be up that will have like testimonies from students, pictures of dorms, uh, different groups and things like that. Um, And I would say just like go online and like Google things you're interested in, whether it's clubs, whether it's academic departments and email people. We all will respond and 
faculty yeah. members will also respond and they can give you people to talk to. Can you like hammer that home like with all of you? Cause like, I know it's so scary. I know Ben, you're, you're talking about, you know, I think being intimidated, maybe it was you or, or Paige, but like really like just tell them like, like truly, do you want, like, are you okay with them reaching out to you? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, please do this. Cause like yeah. you are, you're just students now in the future and you're and you're all like so nice i mean i can tell you're like you're really wonderful and it's it's really it's really tremendous um i know i've kept you a, like a really short story let me quick yeah. just like plug this in like yeah. i met a student who was on a tour of princeton when i was giving a tour my freshman spring and he just got into princeton and we've been texting since then like he had, because I gave my number at the end of the tour and he reached out with a question. And for the past like years, he's been reaching out to me with questions as he's gone through the college process and is now like in Princeton. And I love that. Like, I love when I can like help someone, even if it's just like answering one question over text message. So find us on, on social media. That's great. <laughs> you know, for our, quarantine day. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. You know what? Our, our internet dragged a little bit and I'm going to edit this as well but I wanna make sure your story page, I wanna make sure that comes through. Can you just tell me it one more time the same way so I can make sure that we get this? Yeah, so um, my first year at Princeton, I was giving a tour and I gave my phone number at the end of the tour. And one of the um, prospective students who had come on the tour reached out to me afterwards. And he and I have been texting on and off as he's asked me questions and tried to navigate the college process. And he just got into Princeton this spring and I'm so excited that he'll be there next year and I'll be a senior. Um, and I love, I love just being able to help people. We don't necessarily have to have that kind of a relationship, but just reaching out with one text about um, a question, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, and I think especially that, I think you mentioned this, Kate, that you're in quarantine or everybody's self-isolating, that you have more time and more yeah. bandwidth. Like, totally. this is the, the gift. Like, I don't know if I could have gotten the three of you to talk for this long, like, have you not been <laughs> given this gift? Right, like, because you're so busy. And, yeah. that's the, and that's the gift. Um, I could talk to you for another 45 minutes, and I want to be respectful of your time. I didn't talk to you about mental health and dealing with the stress and anxiety of being a student on campus. Is there anything that someone wants to include or add on how to help deal with that? I know it's, it's like a big question. I'm like, oh, and mental health and stress and anxiety and all the stuff that everybody's dealing with, you know? Yeah. If you, I, I'm sure you have thoughts on that. I think, um, cause like for me coming in New York, I had a therapist in high school and like, then when I got to Princeton, I didn't feel, I was like, oh, maybe I don't need one. And I like tried to get one through the, like the, um, through CPS, which like helps with a lot of mental health stuff. And I didn't click with the therapist. So then I just kind of gave up. And I feel like in a lot of ways, I haven't put the effort in that I should have into actually finding someone here that is separate from the Princeton world. Um, well, actually, I feel like I found that person now, but it wasn't through a typical therapy pathway. Now it's through a lot of the religious groups I'm a part of that kind of give me that support. But I think it's so important to find those people. And they, I find like adults or like even a faculty member or a staff person at, on campus or a leader of a group that is an adult or someone even just in the community off campus who is someone who's who can really just kind of be a talking person to vent with, to talk to, to go to for advice. Because the community with friends is really great. But I think when you're all going through the same stuff and you're all kind of in the same bubble of stress and dealing with everything, sometimes it's not as effective as having an adult. Maybe that's your parents. Maybe it's someone at home that you can call whenever. But to have that person put the effort into doing that, because even if you don't think it's going to get stressful, it's going to. And it's so important to have someone you feel comfortable talking to about stuff. Yeah. Having someone in your corner who's safe. Who, yeah. who, who can be there and everybody needs that. And thanks for sharing that. I have a therapist um, and it's, it's a really important part of my life to have someone who doesn't have the same last name. Um, and when you start off at a new place, it's hard to do that knowing that you, you did do that and through the spiritual group, that's great through psychological or through the counseling uh, group as well. Um, yeah. Okay, the, if people have more questions about this, they could reach out to you. Um, I've got two, two final things and then I promise we are done. Um, but the two final things, People want to know how you got in 
And I think everybody has an it. There's a reason they got in. There's something beyond, because you're all really highly intellectual. You've done great. You, you, you have tremendous test scores, I'm sure, right? That's true, right? Like, you did well. None of you didn't do well, right? Ben, did you not do well? <laughs> you did okay. Yeah. Okay, so you all did well. Right? I was just reading. I was reading your your uh, your face there. Um, so you, you you've all done you've all done well. But what's the thing? What do you think? And and it's not just be humble. What your it? Like why why do you think you got into Princeton? If there's someone who's like, oh, I want to go in, and I've got all these great qualities, but like, what's your it? So so Kate, what was your it that you that that got you in? That you think got you in? Yeah. I always talk to people on my tour. I always say that I think the reason I probably got into Princeton. One, I think my arts helped a lot because I think at the point that I was applying to Princeton, they're building the arts center and kind of wanting to bring people in that were going to help that. Um, but two, I think that I took advantage of my high school experience to like, like I took advantage of it a lot. There were like certain opportunities that were very limited, certain academic opportunities that were very limited in my high school, but I did everything possible to be as involved as possible and take like the classes that were the most challenging to take, to do, to make the most of the high school that I was at. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important when Princeton's looking at your high school, like you can only do so much in the context of the school you're going to in high school. But if you do the, if you can make the most out of it and um, yeah, I think that's, I just think that's super important because obviously like there's no way to compare one high school to another but they want to look at you in the context of your school. And in the context of your school, are you taking leadership positions? Are you, you know, focused on community and not just, you know, <laughs> writing a list of community service and stuff for the purpose of getting into school, but you actually care about your high school community and wanting to make it better and make the most of it. They can smell if you care or not. Yeah. You know, yeah. it stinks if you're, and then Ben, what do you think your it was? And I can't ever say I know for sure. Again, I, I don't, it, this wasn't at the time something I imagined I would have the opportunity to do. I think if there's one thing that certainly helped me, I don't know if it's a, an it or not, is using uh, the different parts of my, uh, my application to show as much of me as possible, if that makes sense. You're not going to be able to sum up yourself in 650 words and a couple of lists, uh, but if you take the time to focus different aspects on the different parts, I think it's easy to disadvantage yourself by saying, I am going to be this one thing and I'm going to be the best at one thing and nobody is one thing. So instead trying to show like the most holistic picture of yourself possible, I mm -hmm. think uh, is, is very, very helpful in that process. Paige, what do you think of was your it factor? Yeah, this is a super hard question. Um, <laughs> I think if anything was that I like refused to give myself an it in mm -hmm. my application. Like a lot of what I wrote about in my applications to college was kind of like my refusal to be boxed in by one label that my high school process had been coaches and teachers telling me you need to just do one thing. You can't be on the basketball team and do theater. You got to pick. You can't, you know, be um, interested in the humanities, but also want to do some science research on the back end. Like you, you have to choose. And I had dug my heels in and I refused to choose because I was genuinely, not like for a resume, but because I was genuinely interested in everything that I was doing. And so I, I, I think my application was like, I have a lot of interests. This is me. I'm excited to just like jump in and try a lot of different stuff when I come to Princeton. And I think they are looking for passion and people who are going to jump in feet first in the community, whatever, whatever community that's going to be for you on Princeton, that, that differs based on the person. But I think Princeton as an institution is looking for people who are going to help build a community who yeah. aren't just like flat. Yeah. Yeah. I think that authenticity, I mean, I feel like that, you know, that just, it just, people can feel it. They can feel it and being authentic, scary. Because if people don't want you and you're authentic, then what does that say? But it says you go somewhere else and you find something else because you can become and do and live the dream that you want to live. Uh, in closing, what I'd like to do is have you just say a couple sentences to the eighth grader who's out there who really wants to follow a similar path but maybe doesn't know how to follow it. 
maybe they're a first generation student, maybe they don't have the, the money or resources, uh, maybe people have told them that that's not a realistic path for them. Uh, I want them to be able to see you and to know how they can become you. So that to that eighth grader, rather than talking about what you'd say, I want you to actually talk to that eighth grader who is watching this and just tell that eighth grader, what do they need to do to get where you are today? And you can keep it short and brief and uh, they can follow up and ask you more if they wanna live that dream. Um, Kate, why don't we start with you and then we'll just go to Paige and then we'll wrap up with you, Ben. Oof, to think about this, I don't. We can go, we can start with Ben and we can go the other way. Paige, you're in the middle or we can <laughs> start with Paige. Ben, why don't we start with you? Okay, I'd say you don't know what's going to happen and that's a good thing. <laughs> um, you, uh, it is perfectly okay and perhaps even advantageous to make plans and have schemes and things you wanna go for and reach for and things like that, but don't yep. discount things as impossibilities just because you're scared. Mm, I love that, thank you. Paige, what would you say? Um, follow your gut on like what you're passionate about and what you're interested in. Like do what you want to do in high school and do it to the fullest extent. And like, just like in explore all of your interests and be your full self as much as you can be. Um, and Princeton is not out of the question for you, no matter what your background is like, period. Um, like, I know that like, we're all like white and not first gen sitting here. But I think we all know that we are friends with those people. I, I, for me, Princeton was the cheapest option for me. Like counting state schools, Princeton was the cheapest option for me. I'm not by no means rich. And that was, and so do not think that Princeton is this th this thing that's only only to a certain type of person or only to a certain a certain income level you can have a seat at that table because that table you have every right to that table so go for it <laughs> thank you and kate um yeah i think to what Paige was saying earlier you don't have to feel like you don't feel like you have to fit in some box that's already defined, has already been written, that you have to write a book that's already on the shelf, written by someone else, that you can make your own path and it doesn't have to be the traditional path that your guidance counselor thinks is the, the right and safe path or that your parents think you know, is the path that you should go down because it's the one that they feel the most comfortable or confident in. Like You can define your own path and don't be afraid to take the path that that your gut is telling you, but that maybe everyone else is telling you not to go down. Because Princeton, like to so many people feels like this, as Paige was saying, like feels like this distant thing, but it's not like it can be, it's so accessible in so many ways. And like, we're all here and wanting to talk to you about it. And I think that, yeah, it, it, you're, you don't have to, especially like with the application, with your high school experience, with everything, you don't have to just, um, feel like you have to fit a mold like you can just create your own your own interests and put them together in this whole package and you don't have to feel like you have to hide things or put things more forward just to get into Princeton or check a box um yeah you can write it yourself and create a new really uh, amazing experience and just being you and you are all you all seem really great at being you and you've somehow gotten to that place. And I think that really comes through in our conversation today. Um, I can't thank you enough for being so generous with your time and also with the uh, offer that you're willing to help people to answer their questions. And I hope people will take you up on that. And I also am available. I'm in your corner. For those of you who are watching, students, parents, whoever you are. Um, with my panelists, I want you to stick around just for one second. I'm going to stop the Facebook Live and I just want to give you a personal goodbye. But for everybody watching this, thank you so much. I'm so grateful you can be here. Let me know what we can do to support you and uh, feature other students in other campuses so that we can help you to create the experience and live the life that you dream of living. Thank you so much. I'm Harlan Cohn. And it's been great to have you. And, th and thank you all panelists so much for being here. Thank you. Of course. Thank you.